course in these uh, uh, conditions, and I would like to congratulate uh, Jean-Hervé Lorenzi and the whole team of the Cirque des Economistes, because this is beautiful. It's a real feat. They've done a great job. I'm extremely honored to uh, moderate this uh, inaugural session and very happy to be back in Aix-en-Provence. We had to weather a crisis that is not uh, uh, finished, uh, of, uh, extremely severe, which touched everyone, which has impacted everyone, the whole world, whatever origin you are. And uh, what are the lessons that we can draw from it? What did we learn from in 2020? Well, how to anticipate better these events, these crises, the deep uh, shock. How can we uh, weather this incredible drop in GDP, uh, incredible increase in the debt? When do we get back to normal, even though the Delta variant uh, is uh, giving us extra concern? What lessons have we learned in the field of health? Obviously, states had to intervene massively should they continue. Our relationship to work has changed. Will this last? What will be the consequence uh, uh, on the link between generations? Uh, yes, uh, yesterday we knew we had an ecological change. Should we accelerate? What about uh, uh, the urban uh, development? Uh, should we uh, work from home has changed? things, uh, is it going to increase uh, inequalities? So thanks to Patrick Artus uh, uh, from the Cirque des Economies, uh, uh, head of Natixis uh, Research, uh, the, you, you, had a, you mentioned your book about the last crisis of capitalism. We have uh, Christine Lagarde with us, head of the European Central Bank. And uh, I would like to thank you for being here in person. And we'll also have with us Nadia Calvino, who is second vice president uh, and minister for economy and digitalization of Spain. Thank you very much, madam, for being with us. And uh, another thing which is a great honor, we are also with Melanie Nakagawa, special assistant to uh, John Kerry and Joe Biden in charge of climate. And uh, she'll tell us about all the programs uh, by uh, Joe Biden. And uh, Jules Baudet from uh, La Parole au 1828, he's a student uh, from uh, L'Ecole Normale. He's 22 years old. And uh, there are real uh, questions uh, from the U. Um, Patrick Artus. Uh, well, thank you, Ruth, and hello again. I'm going to introduce this session as uh, we traditionally do. What have we learned and what do we still have to learn? Uh, because uh, uh, this is also true. I have five or six points I'd like to mention about the various elements of this discussion. First of all, I believe we have understood that there will be more crisis. Uh, we don't know whether there will be a health crisis. Most of the doctors feel it's true. Will we have a geopolitical crisis, cyber safety, security crisis, financial crisis? This seems most probable in view of the uh, financial imbalances. And we have to go from a defensive approach, which was well carried out, in fact, in particular in Europe, to a preventative one. Uh, I don't see how we could uh, repeat in four or five years the strategy we've had to use this time to, f uh, to fight this crisis with a massive debt, massive intervention of the central banks. There's a limit to being on a defensive, uh, in a defensive action. So we have to avoid uh, that type of crisis in the future. Financially, we have to avoid the imbalances. We were saying that we're all concerned about the real estate market at global level in the health field. We have to separate the humans from the animals. So there's a way uh, uh, of looking at things, which means we must prevent crisis uh, rather than reacting to them once they're there. The other thing we've learned is that uh, the economic response could be very different from what we had thought of. We still, we uh, thought some things were possible with budgets, uh, monetary policies, 
We have public deficit of 16% of GDP in the US with an, uh, an interest rate which is almost zero. But I'm not sure uh, that uh, we have all understood that there's no free lunch and that these interventions will have a cost. We don't know yet what the cost will be. Will it be a bubble on the price of assets? Will it be the uh, uh, a way, uh, something to pay for the ability to react in the future? And I'm a bit worried about the negative aspects of this, and uh, uh, which seem to last more than the positive aspects. Third thing, I still have two minutes left. We understood that our economies are extremely heterogeneous. You have some that are more or less well protected on the labor market. Some sectors do well, others not. Uh, rich countries are being vaccinated, poor countries are not. And so we have quite a lot of questions about the social system in our countries, international relationship. And uh, obviously, this means a lot of questions. We'll talk about that with you later on. I've got a couple of points to add here. And it's a debate which we had a minute ago with Philippe Ayon. This crisis is accelerating the digitization of the economy. And we must not only take this positively. What have we learned? We've learned to reflect on the consequences of increased digitization. It means that it impacts the way we work. Everybody is aware of Nicholas Bloom's work in this subject and, how, and the impact on town planning and the way that we all work. It will change where people carry out their business. It will carry out the nature of jobs and not always in a good direction. And the final point, and this is a point which we all evoked a second ago, and this is my final point here, we have understood the importance of um, disruptive uh, innovation and we know how important it is to have this disruptive innovation a blend between the role of the public public and the private sectors the way it's funded do our states able to take the risk that will make it possible to have this disruptive innovation and uh, that has all been uh, assassinated by the crisis well there will be a round table uh, tomorrow on the risk and daring so I'm just putting in a little ad there for that session tomorrow so, Christine Lagarde, we are so lucky to have you with us here in the flesh. And I'm very curious to find out what kind of uh, lessons you have drawn from this period, not only because of your role with the, the European Central Bank, but also on a personal front. What kind of le what's the main lesson that you've uh, drawn from this experience? Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Good afternoon, everybody. And good afternoon uh, to my fellow panel members. So Ruth has asked me to give you my personal point of view. So if you were hoping for scoops about monetary policy, you're going to be disappointed. However, I'm going to talk about what is closest to my heart, i.e. Europe right now. And uh, when I have doubt about Europe, then I turn to Victor Hugo or Paul Valéry. And Paul Valéry sums up uh, he was a real fan of Europe. He really sums up a feeling that we all more or less, ha more or less have experienced through this uh, COVID. And it has given us an, es an extra uh, aspect of uh, humanity and humility. He said that we know that we are mortal. You are all mortal. We're all mortal. We have all uh, been brought back to the uh, reality of death. A lot of us uh, are in good health. Some might have had... Uh, a, a health weakness and uh, caught COVID, whereas you might be expecting COVID in one direction, but it came from another. It's reminded us that we are all human. We all belong to humanity. And I think it's given us a huge lesson in humility because we have all been in this situation of being totally powerless. So that's the first point. The second point in this personal point of view that comes to mind in, in what we've all learned is that the book which was the most bought and read during the pandemic, strangely enough, was Camus' book, La Peste. And, and the doctor in that book says a, a sentence, something along the lines of, there's much more to be admired in man than there is to be despised in man. And we have noted that during the pandemic, and for some of us at least, it, it boosted us, it made us want to uh, fight the virus. 
it's a terrible health uh, and economic uh, crisis because we've seen all kinds of support and solidarity and friendship and then all of a sudden we realize what value all of those things hold so let's hold on to that notion of solidarity that we witnessed and on many occasions remember cast your mind back let's take a look at what we did in europe and here I would say that we were we had great solidarity in terms of uh, monetary initiatives, uh, financial and economic initiatives, and I want to say a couple of words about this without uh, uh, boasting about what the Central European Bank is doing. But we were very very fast in a matter of a week. Within seven days, we had put together a support program for the economy, respecting the mandate which uh, has been given to us and which guides all of our our work. We set up programs that were huge in terms of funding the economy and also in terms of uh, supporting in monetary terms and also in terms of avoiding a, a fragmentation that was uh, hovering over our heads right back in the month of March 2021. So that support was expressed in a very strong, strong way and it wasn't always easy to reach a consensus, admittedly. However, it was possible, including with uh, central banks that are not known for uh, their uh, monetary solidarity. So financial solidarity was uh, obvious because the uh, next generation EU has a huge budget and that was designed in the month of May by two European leaders and developed and approved by the entire uh, European community. And so we're starting to uh, harvest the fruits of that. Uh, Pascal Lamy, who is in the vicinity here, has said that Europe can do great things as it can do less good things. But here it really was uh, um, able to deliver things one month ahead of what was scheduled. So solidarity in terms of uh, finance and health. We can always remember the problems, we can always remember the arguments and the do-it-yourself measures that we came up with, but their solidarity did come about and uh, we all felt uh, this solidarity being expressed. So one point which might surprise you because today it's politically correct to talk about uh, deglobalization, a return to regionalization and shorter value chains, etc. etc. I would like to quote four names, five names. Two you may know, the three you absolutely won't know Francois Jacob, Jacques Monod. You might know those names. They created the messenger ARN. Katarine Karoko. She also worked on the messenger RNA. 65-year-old Hungarian immigrant works in the United States for 40 years. She works on the messenger RNA. And Gugu Sayen and Oslem Toshin, who are two Germans who emigrated from Turkey and they worked on the messenger RNA, worked for BioNTech, uh, and it, their ingredient is in the vaccine which many of us have had. And that was absolute manna from heaven. So these are wonderful examples of globalization because these people traveled, they moved, they were funded, they um, got the best out of intelligent globalization and we have to continue working at that because uh, what I have learned from the crisis is that we're all in the same boat when you're faced with constraints such as COVID. We're all in the same boat when we're faced with climate change and imperatively we all have to take a look at our tools. We have tools that have been absolutely efficient in the past. When you see state aid, we managed to do without uh, that for a while. Take a look at the imperatives of European budgetary policy. The escape clause was a tool which we use and is still in force to help the, uh, so the states to survive. When I look at uh, the monetary policies, the way in which we've managed and succeeded in supporting the euro, boundlessly the tools were there and now we have to wonder whether the tools need to be dusted down updated because when you use a tool a lot you uh, really have to uh, make sure that it's still working and identify whether you might need extra tools and so these are the challenges that are waiting for us here in Europe to be ready for the next crisis because you're you're right Patrick there will be another crisis there will be two future crises and we have to be ready for them so that's what I wanted to say can you give us an example of the tools 
What kind of tools are you referring to? Well, tools that pertain to globalization, which in my mind are essential. Uh, the agreement, which has just been signed by the OECD with 33 member states, they're not, they haven't all signed yet, but I think there's a momentum which has been uh, triggered, and let's not let uh, this go. I hope next week there will be further um, agreements, which are great in terms of taxation, not, not uh, what's that? yes, for taxation. And um, it uh, is an open discussion, and it means that we that optimization is available, but despite that optimization, I think uh, the different states uh, uh, are interested in how this revenue is used. Above a certain threshold, the tax level, the tax will be attributed to this, that, or the other state because the activities take place there, and at the moment they are not being paid because of that optimization policy that's in the place. There's a second area where we have perhaps misused the tool slightly. We should uh, uh, ask how we could use it properly in a very digital world, and that's the uh, uh, competition law. That's been very, very useful. Uh, several states have used it as a pretext to call into question uh, optimized regimes implemented by certain states. I think this uh, competition, the right to competition, is it abuse of a dominant position? Is it, uh, what, well, what is it? I think we have to, definitely clean up that right to competition to make it more efficient in a world where a dominant position by a big tech company, for example, will all of a sudden become a very powerful lever to use information and then play a sovereign role that uh, does not belong to such a, such a company. Well, thank you very much, Christine Lagarde. Nadja Calvino, thank you very much uh, for joining us to speak. So you are the second vice president of the Spanish government. You're minister for the economy and digitalization. So Spain has been sorely touched by, sorely impacted by the pandemic. Europe was there to help Spain and all other countries as well. But by the same token, we heard Christine Lagarde saying this, we just managed to get by, we scraped through. So should we be self-critical? Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I'm so sorry not to be with you in the flesh in Aix-en-Provence. So it's uh, the, the fa my favorite uh, appointment in the entire year. I'm so sorry not to be with you, but thank you very much for inviting me anyway. And I would like to share five points with you reacting to what Christine has just said and Patrick Artus as well, because I think it was very interesting what both of them said. My first point is that uh, we have governed vulnerability. We saw that health and the economy go hand in hand, and you, you can't associate them. We have seen a lot of humility insofar as usually what we saw as normality in between crises, whatever crises you might be talking about, is, is upturned. So we uh, are used to more stability. And having said that, we have just exited from a very dark period. And we must be happy about what we did successfully during the period. And I think Europe did react very well. We had huge challenges to rise to, and there are still many more ahead of us. But I believe we have a survived a stress test, which no one could have imagined. The central banks could never have dreamt, so, dreamt up such a crash test. The, even the most sadistic uh, uh, experts could never have imagined it. And so uh, we know what mechanisms are strong, or what, have re what has reacted well, and protected what is most important so that we have strong foundations for recovery. And we're seeing the signs of that in the streets. That's my first point. Second point, we have also uh, learned, and Patrick Atus mentioned this, it costs less to uh, prevent than it does to cure. And so since March 2020, the European Central Bank played a very major role. 
as did the different finance ministries in the different countries. They, were all, they, they all showed great solidarity. They knew they were all in the same boat. And we all needed to act very, very quickly with new tools. We had to be very creative. And I think this time we reacted rather well. And we have come through the crisis. And it's very different. The way that we've come through would have been very different had we not uh, rolled up our sleeves altogether. So uh, this reconstruction of the deconstruction is uh, a big job ahead of us. And it's very uh, it's different to what we did after the financial crisis we experienced not so long ago. The, another point is to do with intergenerational justice. And I do believe that it's really good that a young 22-year-old is going to take the floor after, after me, because we have uh, invested all kinds of public resources in the response to this crisis, 150 billion euros uh, added onto the debt in Spain. I'm sure it's the same thing in France, not to mention the American programs. And it's essential that we do not find ourselves with a big dip in investments. We have to use the money wisely to make sure that there is a better future for the next generations. And I really do believe that we have very great social risks if we do not have a good investment and reform program for the future. And that's why I believe that Europe is reacting in a positive manner, not only in the short term, but also in the medium and long terms, with a recovery program which is very ambitious. And in Spain, we are aware of uh, what the European reaction is. And and it's a huge responsibility that and we have to take the right decisions now to construct a better future. My fourth point, I don't want to go too much into detail, but uh, there are challenges that are ne not national, they're not even European, they are global, planetary. So we are developing law agreements on tax, of course, but we also have to work in health, monetary policy, tax uh, policies. I think the challenges are of such scope that, and I'm sure our American colleague will talk about uh, the climate amongst other things, and I'd like to talk about uh, numerization to to end with. I think here there are challenges, but my point of view is more positive on this score. I think it's very encouraging that the younger generations are seeing um, the structural changes that we're going through right now, uh, that they are speeding up due to the pandemic, and the younger generations are very positive. And in history, whenever there's been a, a huge change, a, a change of era or epoch, that has always brought, uh, it's always destroyed some elements, but it's also constructed new opportunities. And I think that uh, in such situations, we must not be afraid. We must not imagine everything's dark and negative because uh, that's the climate which is uh, which enables extremism and uh, populism to uh, thrive, and uh, they 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 are fueled by fear, and so we have to have faith, and we have to be convinced that we will be able to harness digitization to make it positive and a success. And uh, it's really important to get back to essentials, get back to our basics and to protect the values, the principles, and uh, the laws that make Europe a beacon for the rest of the world. And I think in, on this score, well, in Spain, we are talking a lot, we're working a lot about uh, digital rights, because we have to ensure that all of these values and these rights are protected in the new digital reality that we're all entering into because uh, we're no longer in the, uh, uh, the old-fashioned world anymore and it has to be a success. So thank you very much for offering me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Merci beaucoup, merci uh, Madame Calvino. Thank you very much, Mrs. Calvino. Please stay with us. And this is a great example. We're uh, talking directly to Spain, and now we're going over to Washington. Uh, 
Biden. This is Nakagawa. You're advisor to President Joe Biden. You're advising him on climate issues. Joe Biden was elected on a promise. He said, I will draw the lessons from the crisis. How does the American administration show to the Americans that they are drawing these lessons on a daily basis? Great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me here. And again, sorry, I cannot be there in person. I would love to be there. It looks beautiful inside that room. And so really, thank you again for inviting me. It's both a personal honor and a privilege uh, to be here speaking with you and representing the Biden-Harris administration and to share with you a little bit about what we've done in the last several months at the start of this administration, particularly as it relates to climate, energy, and environmental goals and our priorities. You're absolutely right. The president has made a commitment to bring the lessons learned from 2020, both a really difficult year, but also I'm an eternal optimist. And so I'll share both some of the challenges and what we learned from those challenges, but also what are some of the positive lights and opportunities that we saw from 2020 that are bringing that we're bringing into this administration and into our policies that we're beginning to carry forward um, throughout this year and for the remainder of this, this term. So first, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, in my capacity, I've joined the administration as a previously as an investor in climate technology, as a former diplomat and as a policy advisor. And what makes it really exciting uh, this time around and this particular moment that we're in is the confluence of three really important areas that are creating unbelievable tailwinds for this administration and for this decisive decade on climate change. We all know what the science is telling us and what's screaming at us, frankly, in many parts of our country and throughout Europe. Um, as I sit here today, the West Coast of the United States is witnessing unprecedented heat. Um, Portland, Oregon has set another heat record, one that they just uh, set last time on Sunday, and it's yet again surpassed that recently. We also have uh, what we've entered into is yet another um, wildfire season that some reflect is now called almost a wildfire year. And again, we've got a, a hurricane season that's uh, fast approaching and that we've just started. So a couple of things I want to share in terms of reflections, both from the I'll share four reflections from last year coming into this year. First, um, given an optimist, I'll start with the negative and I'll end with the positive. The first really is around the extreme weather events of last year. Um, not only did we see you know, the unbelievable and unprecedented global pandemic that we are, many of us are still recovering from, but in addition to that, you also saw unbelievable extreme weather events. Last year, the hurricane season in America set a, a, a record of, I think, 30 uh, named storms last year, and that's, that's really and not only were they um, destructive storms, but they also were really costly storms. So you have the weather events that are providing a real urgency and a sense of uh, need and a time sensitivity to actions. And so that is it brings me to my first sort of key mega trend of last year, which is policy. Um, you saw last year, and particularly led out of Europe, a real doubling down and a commitment to ensuring that our policies and our economic recovery are tied to a climate and a green agenda. Uh, Europe made it very clear at the start that their economic recovery will be a green recovery. And that's a key lesson that we brought into this administration. You saw the American Jobs Plan and most recently the bipartisan infrastructure framework, which I'll share a bit more about, a key commitment to ensuring that our economic recovery is a green recovery and demonstrating the fact that, you know, when we want to talk about advancing jobs, creating jobs and building back better, to be honest, it is all about creating jobs and addressing a sustainable uh, and a climate a climate friendly future to the way America builds back better. The second area, uh, in addition to the policy trend that we saw from last year and the growth of policies that are driving climate, uh, climate change positive solutions, the other key aspect is from that policy you saw finance flow. Uh, last year, you saw some of the uh, largest investments in climate finance. Multilateral development banks invested $66 billion in climate finance. You saw, you know, from my old, my former role, uh, venture capital reach an all-time high. Around $16 billion was invested in climate technology specifically last year from the, the venture world. And then you also saw public sector investment. Again, unprecedented uh, pandemic recoveries and green recovery packages being moved last year that, again, lay the foundation for what America is doing this time around. We ourselves are moving forward with ambitious recovery packages and packages that have climate integrated throughout it and a clean, sustainable recovery integrated into that. The second key area after policy is, again, the technology. Not only do you see 
the ambitious policies on the table. You see the finance flowing, and then sorry, the third is the fine. Uh, the, sorry, first is the policy. Second is the technology. Is the finance, and then third is the uh, technology. Because where finance is flowing is where technology exists today and where technology will be going. We're seeing massive investments in uh, clean energy technologies, sustainable technologies, ways to grow food more efficiently with less water and less fertilizer use. And you're just seeing ways to grow more with less um, energy efficiencies on the rise, building efficiency. As we all worked from home, you saw commuting times go down. And then the realization that investment in public infrastructure and public transit is really important. Uh, that people People don't want to spend time commuting and hours commuting. We want to really make that more efficient as we all return to work as we get out of this recovery. So really the key lessons of 2020 around the importance of policy being a key signal and demand driver for sustainable recovery underlays the bipartisan investment framework, infrastructure framework that was just recently uh, discussed by President Biden. The extreme weather events of last year really underpinned the fact that just on Wednesday, uh, two days ago, President Biden hosted a bipartisan group of Western governors to talk about how we can not only, as one of my panelists just commented, we learned last year that uh, prevention is far less costly than the cure. And so we're looking at ways we can prevent wildfires and, pre and prevent and invest in resilience to avoid those the damages that are caused by extreme weather. And then we also saw the importance of investing in technology last year, whether it's digital technologies or others. And again, the president is committed to quadruple investment in clean energy technology, clean energy innovation. And then lastly, the role of finance. And as many of us in the room here today know, it's just so vitally important to any of our economic recoveries. And again, whether it's climate finance, uh, I particularly have been focused on what the U.S. is doing on international climate finance and a significant step up uh, in our assistance in that category, but also domestically, how we're investing at home and really trying to build back better uh, through various policy packages and done so in a, in a very bipartisan way. So that is just some key trends that we're carrying forward into, into 2020. Um, I, I look forward to this discussion and thanks again for having me. Euh, une toute petite question, Madame euh, Nakagawa. Euh, juste, vous avez le sentiment One small question, Mrs. Nakagawa. Uh, do you have a feeling, despite the major divides uh, that are persisting between two parts of the population, those who voted for Joe Biden and those who voted Trump, do you think you're going to manage this challenge uh, that you have? In one word. <laughs> Um, I absolutely think that uh, what we need to think about is exactly where we find that bipartisan compromise, and especially when it comes to key issues like sustainability or building back better our climate. I just wanted to highlight a few things that were announced recently in this bipartisan infrastructure framework, which is really um, an unprecedented first ever massive investment in America. It's the largest long-term investment in our infrastructure in nearly a century. And this again reflects where both Republicans and Democrats and everything in between and around the entire political circle, what we all agree to. And so that's things such as investment in public transit. It is the largest investment in public transit to date, around $49 billion. It is also the largest investment in passenger rail since the creation of Amtrak. It is the largest investment in repairing our nation's bridges since the construction of the interstate highway program. Merci. It's also focused on investing in building an in electric vehicle infrastructure, whether it's charging and fleets. And so these are all measures that, you know, to many of you might sound like climate or clean energy measures, but these are all measures that are part of our infrastructure, that are part about part about how we actually achieve our ambitious climate targets that the president set forward. And what underpins all of that is that there's a bipartisan nature to all of it. And so while it may look like, and it, you know, in some ways it re there is a divide among some of these topics in America, there are areas where we can come together in a bipartisan and fashion that are, I think are so critical. And so really thank you for that question. And, and I am excited to showcase how we're coming together as a country and as, as, as truly one nation. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour cette réponse optimiste, en fait. Thank you very much for this optimistic answer. Okay. The youngsters have the floor now. Uh, Gilles Baudet, student, 22 years old. Are you the sacrifice generation of 2020? This is the main issue. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the circle for uh, giving me the floor. I believe that the big question that my generation has is uh, what objectives uh, for the future? 
if you look at what happened since the beginning of the pandemic, we realized that the first thing we tried to do was to reduce the number of uh, uh, deaths uh, thanks to the health measure and to protect the economy at all costs. And we heard all the indicators that were given today, uh, unemployment, income. But if you look at what really happened at a more micro level, whether it be individual or local level, you realize that there are a number of intangible subjective indicators that were highly affected by this crisis and that might be uh, those that will uh, remain uh, the most deeply scarred. I'm thinking, first of all, about uh, mental health. You all know that isolation, uh, family circles, the reduction of the social uh, interaction have led to an increase in depressive states, especially in young, uh, young people. Apparently, 40% of 18, 24 years old have uh, troubles and uh, feel anxious, uh, much more than the rest of the population. The youngsters uh, lived this crisis uh, in this way, first of all, because we were deprived of a very important uh, aspect at our age, which is sociability social interaction. And there's also another issue, which is the fact that our focus on these more traditional economic objectives meant that the young and many of these populations that are not concerned by these indicators were somewhat forgotten or appeared very late in the political priorities. If you think about the, the main uh, policy about uh, partial, partial unemployment, uh, this uh, protected a part of the population while we were not yet on uh, the labor market. Uh, but uh, in reality, we, there are less and less uh, job offers, uh, short-term uh, job offers. So this led to more precariousness for youngsters. Over two-thirds of them uh, say that they had uh, financial trouble in 2021 still. This figure is not uh, uh, coming down. And there's a cruel lack of an economic net to protect them, and no basic revenue, no basic income, and I'm sure this will come uh, appear in the discussion. Another thing which was a major issue is trust. 64% of uh, French people do not trust the government today. There's a huge uncertainty which was codified and uh, led to by a very centralized governance, uh, very little negotiation, and this has fed into the lack of trust that had come before the crisis with the, the so-called yellow vests. The, the other point is that uh, uh, this governance uh, was not that efficient for a young uh, precariousness in the youngsters, this governance uh, uh, really uh, led to more precariousness despite the warning signals uh, sent uh, by the, uh, 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 the associations in the field. Okay, there's the Citizens' Convention, the discussions on climate, but we realized that that part of the population was forgotten. Uh, uh, in uh, the discussions. Uh, while this uh, citizens' convention would be a way to restore trust if it was truly integrated at in institutional level and not just uh, uh, decided on by uh, the govern government because of specific circumstances. And we realized that the COVID crisis has uh, led to the emergence of a whole list of uh, inequalities that were not very present uh, in the public discussion. Uh, access to housing, to good food, good nutrition, and all these elements were not part of the, poli uh, of the policies and political uh, goals. One of the reasons being this kind of uh, obsession with GDP. Uh, by way of conclusion, I would like to say that this crisis uh, led us to challenge the basic objectives. We realized with this crisis that uh, employment, income, and even physical health are not the only components of uh, social well-being. 
if you really want to uh, cover the major challenges such as environmental crisis, inequalities and others, we'll have to completely review our economic accounting and uh, find a more democratic mode of governance. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting reflection. Uh, Christine Lagarde, I saw that you were listening uh, carefully to this. Inequalities appeared uh, and were mentioned uh, in a somewhat violent way. Uh, you have uh, mentioned uh, worries uh, on growth because of the Delta variant. Uh, what is your reflection? Well, first of all, says uh, Christine Lagarde, I'd like to thank uh, Gilles because even though he has something we would all like to have, meaning 22 years old, being 22 years old, well, it's not easy at his age to take the floor in, such, in front of such a huge audience. Now, what has me somewhat surprised is when you say that uh, we gave priority to economic elements. Uh, some uh, countries in the world did so, uh, and this was totally leaving aside uh, life, health, and the protection of uh, people. But even though we didn't, may not have done so well, we tried to protect life, and uh, not necessarily youngsters, but uh, the choices in Europe were uh, choices made in favor of uh, life, and not, as uh, in the first action decided, not uh, the the uh, decisions were not made to maintain employment or economics. Uh, it was really to protect uh, men and women, young and old, uh, against uh, this COVID crisis. So obviously, we'll have to uh, revise our softwares. We'll have to recalculate how we define the economic value and not just uh, as we've done so for much too long, even though some of us have criticized that, not continue uh, restricting it, uh, restricting our calculations to GDP. There are other things apart from GDP, but uh, the, the direction uh, uh, aiming at uh, uh, life is something that Europe has done. In view of uh, the way, in view of what happened with youngsters just finishing their studies and starting to uh, arrive on the labor market, they were stopped, they were blocked. This is true. And this is where uh, budgetary policies, not monetary policies, because this cannot be done in monetary policies, but uh, the other policies must uh, uh, make an effort so that uh, the youngsters are able to uh, make that step ahead that they uh, weren't able to make because of the COVID crisis. So we have to do this together with the young people. So this means, says Rotel Kriev, that we could think of a, a, a new deficit to give a new boost and create uh, jobs for these youngsters. No, says Christine Lagarde, no, it's not in terms of uh, accounting or segregation of budget mass. It's, uh, it's really in terms of budgetary priorities. There are budgets. Uh, all European authorities have uh, encouraged the possibility of continue supporting, continuing to support these elements. So we have to target uh, where, uh, the elements that were most hurt. This is where we must do more good where it was very hard in Italy, Spain, the southern countries. We all worked together. We uh, borrowed together. We gave subsidies together. The same has to be done at the level of societies to avoid intergenerational inequalities. I'm not talking about uh, money, income, or whatever. I'm talking about intergenerational inequalities. We have to be very careful so that uh, we do not lose the COVID generation along the way. Uh, an income for young, for jobs for the young, uh, Patrick Artus, there's a lot being done around that. Well, to continue with what Christine was saying, we now have to look at what was damaged by this crisis and what was not uh, a priority, uh, an immediate priority. Immediately, we had to solve the most urgent uh, things. Then we now find scars or things that have been uh, insidiously dam damaged, as you were saying, trust, the ability for the youngsters to, ac to access the labor market. We know that the 
uh, when uh, a generation comes to the labor market at a bad time, they draw this uh, phenomenon for seven years. It's an issue for seven years. And all this is an intergenerational issue. Uh, income inequalities, or uh, which will be a major issue. Christine should not listen to me, but when you create money, you uh, increase the price of assets. And who holds the assets? The older generation. So uh, we have to check the intergenerational transfer. We hear that when the interest rates are lower than the gross rate, we can do that. But we're really taking uh, and um, uh, seizing revenue uh, for uh, tomorrow. So this is a major issue of reflection. A few questions, perhaps come back to you, uh, Madame Lagarde. One of the things you said yesterday about growth and the Delta variant which is worrying you and its impact on growth forecasts. Well, growth forecasts are, are what they are. The challenge today is to establish the risk balance today. I think it, things are balanced out in terms of risk when you look at the forecast that we have today, the way in which we react to the Delta variant, the way we will speed up vaccination even more, which is the huge difference between the uh, COVID and, and uh, Delta, it really is uh, vaccination. So we really have to grab the ball by the horns and vaccinate everybody. That's the only uncertainty we still have because if Delta spreads quickly, it's an, insert an uncertainty which will weigh heavily in the risk, in the balance between risk and uh, surviving. So there's another question from the audience, uh, Madame Lagarde. What levers might there be to render institutions more agile and populations more resilient to future crises when the states may not have as much money to protect the populations? I just want to come back to what Patrick said earlier on. We have tried to react swiftly, strongly. The amounts that were committed were absolutely humongous, but we were just uh, firefighting, really. Patrick is saying that we now have to switch into a prevention phase so that the day that uh, another crisis comes back, either for the economy or healthcare, that we will have to have uh, enough in our store cupboards to deal with it all. So I think uh, prevention is essential. We do have to go at a reasonable speed um, let uh, growth uh, ramp up again and uh, let society settle down again. We have to uh, do uh, tran make transformations now. Our societies are evolving in light of the risks and the challenges that we have to face. So the European recovery plan with its uh, twin objective to protect the environment and biodiversity and on the other hand to digitalize uh, everything. Well, these two things alone will transform society and will make sure that we are better equipped when the next uh, crisis comes knocking at our door. And I believe we will have a more solid social architecture. Confidence will be back, trust will be back because we will have uh, restored uh, the balance between the generations and uh, interest rates being what they are, growth being what it is. Well, for as long as they uh, survive, we will have a bit of room for manoeuvre because we do, uh, we will one day have to have some room for manoeuvre. Patrick Artus. Uh, what was the question? So uh, how can we ensure we're more agile in the future? Well, there were two aspects to the question. We were agile, I think. Christine Lagarde has already said that. We were amazing. Uh, sadly, Europe only moves forward when the situation is, is devastating. Who could have counted on those 750 billion for the uh, EU generation fund? It was very impressive, this figure. But then it's not only a question of agility. I think what Christine has just said is the issue really is when the next crisis comes along. 
well, it won't be very far. It won't be very far off. So we don't have like 20 years time. Yes, we have uh, public debt, but we've got a couple of decades to get back to normal from 2027. The uh, public debt will be normal then by 2038. No, no, you can't reason like that. There is a key issue, and this is the fact that we have a few years to provide ourselves with enough room for manoeuvre. We haven't got uh, 20 years of, of calm economics in front of us. No, I think this is the challenge. And so what uh, time lapse are we looking at? How long can we continue to do as we always have done? Yes, we were agile. Yes, we injected billions and thousands of billions. We supported everybody. The states intervened. So how long is this going to continue? Or do we say that it, this is the new norm? We just continue as we are doing. Well, this is a unique situation. It could have been much more tragic than it actually has been. The efforts that we have all undertaken to get us out of this unique uh, situation are huge. Once we get beyond this uh, COVID and Delta River, etc., we're going to have to anchor it all. We're going to have to fine tune our tools. We're going to have to create these uh, margins for manoeuvre. Once we have uh, finished that pandemic phase and once recovery is on the road and we have to be sure we can create value together, get uh, trust, confidence back. I mean, it's not we have to uh, be ready to face the next crisis because there will be another crisis. Patrick is right. And uh, the cycles of crises will speed up. We've seen this over the past decades. So we don't, we're not going to have uh, 30 years until the next crisis. Let's have a, a question from our student here, or a comment perhaps. Well, I don't agree with the idea that agility is at a very macroeconomic scale. I agree that, uh, that there has been great efficacy and we've reacted rather well so far. But what I was saying before wasn't saying that uh, we weren't being privileged as youngsters. However, there are a whole series of indicators and uh, feelings that are on a local scale where people are on the field and react very, very quickly, whereas uh, the institutional organization and economic governance and political governance of the state and because it's also centralized and the information takes time to trickle down didn't make it possible to work on those issues quickly enough so I think we have to question centralization and, uh, and it is impact on the democracy because there are so many little factors that uh, uh, will will be the cause of the greatest suffering at the end of the crisis so you have to. So the solution is via it's on a local scale and through the citizens, if I understand you correctly. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to our different uh, panelists from Madrid, Washington, and those present here in the room with us.